it was okay to have a little chat. It was okay to scream at the PR firms and make sure they don't forget that we know they're murderers and they're monsters and we ain't never going to forget them. And that, let me end it by saying, there's three melted reactors which are um, three times the size of Chernobyl. Chernobyl was one-third of the reactors in Fukushima, the size, a 30% meltdown on top of that. So each of these reactors at Fukushima had pools above them. Each pool had around 122,000 rods at 80 rods per bundle, 12 feet long, and 1,535 bundles in each pond that we know about. There could be many more, see? And so if each, each building was 10 stories and had three pools in it, if not five, at least three pools in it, that's 360,000, 66,000 rods in each uh, building. And four buildings had detonation. And like I covered last night, one of the buildings, that's proof now that one of the buildings is photoshopped the pond. And I'll bring that picture up for everybody because we never even touched it. Uh, and as I end the, the show here tonight, let me roll up a little bit. And what you're looking at is the foyer. So So you see that pool there? That's building four. Now here's another shot from the same time, at the exact same time where a drone went and took these shots. Right? Now you can see that looks like that's water in the corner, right? Well I zoomed in on it and that's empty. It's empty. And so uh, that picture and this picture are the same. And so the water used what you think you see there with, a, with what looks like a net over it. That's Photoshop, right? There's no water and there's no net. These pictures were taken at the same time. That picture and that picture. And then the extract shows you there's actually no net there. And why would you put a net there? And how come there's no bodies there? Because there's rods everywhere and the pool is dried out. So the zirconium burnt off it. It caught fire a couple of times because the earthquake picked those buildings up and broke their backs and all the pools in them. And that's very important, you know, that you understand that that's actually true. And that the foyers are below and that we got all kinds of great bloggers will give you a different perspective on Fukushima below. And literally every perspective you can imagine is below. We got such a big variety, but everybody got their heart in the exact right spot. And uh, that's why they're there, you know. I'm so proud to have found these people and that uh, see that there's other people like us who are out there doing the moral and the ethical thing and learning and getting better, more articulate every single day uh, is all we can really hope for. So we'll see you tomorrow. Jester, Wong, Anna Beck, Red Button Studios, Elizabeth, Miss Mug the Clown, of course, as always. Uh, and we don't know how she finds the time to make it to these streams. That lady does not stop. And that's why she's so precious. We'll see you folks tomorrow night. I got to catch up to Mickey's comment. He's got a good comment. Yeah, we're not going to go without. That's why we're here every night. That's why we do what we do. We're building a. Um, we're building the resistance, I guess. We're not activists, okay? Let's get something straight. We're not activists. None of us. Not one of us. And uh, nobody should be allowed to label you as activists. You're not activists. you got every right to be here. you got every right to be concerned. It's the moral and ethical thing to do. And you're actually required by your constitutions, your Bill of Rights, and your Magna Carters. You're obligated. It's your obligation uh, to route out that tyranny, to stomp out that uh, rogue element or that that betrayal of trust uh, that's your obligation you are obligated to do that under your bills of rights and under your constitutions as a citizen under your Magna Carters as a citizen as a person as a sovereign person you uh, are obligated to stand up and speak out. And that doesn't make you an activist, okay? That's your duty. You're required under law to do that, under your bills.
to do that. And so a lot of people can get easily led down the road of activism. So when a media puts out a headline, that's activism too in that case. If we put out a headline, all of a sudden we're activists. We're not activists. We're just one of the legions that are coming. The self-righteous and indignant and justified legions that are coming and growing. And these are not, um, these are every walk of life imaginable, of every education level imaginable, in a unification of understanding that the world is on the brink for quite a long time, and there is no time left to stay on that fence. There is no left side of a fence and a right side of a fence in this, in this, um, you know, I, I, I can't really come up with a name to call anything like that outside of an extinction level event, particularly right away for the Pacific Ocean and every species in it is unimaginable. That if a meteorite was to hit the Pacific Ocean, it wouldn't kill every species in that ocean. And it's about these people creating not necessarily the weapons, but the, the technology to get them off of this planet. Researchers from NASA and U.S. universities say they found evidence that Mars used to have a lake. And they say this means the red planet could have sustained life. The researchers published their findings in the online edition of U.S. academic journal Science. NASA's Curiosity rover landed on Mars in August last year. Scientists have been using it to collect and study the planet's geology. They found signs that a lake existed for tens of thousands of years, and they believe the water had a neutral pH with low salinity. The scientists also say elements conducive to life were abundant in the area, including carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. And that they're going to throw away the entire planet as a last ditch effort because you got no choice to force us off the planet, to force us come up with technology. Not try to save the planet though. No intentions. That's the very opposite of what they're willing to do. That would uh, solidify their existence forever on this planet in their eyes. They have this quench now to leave the planet. Uh, and they knew this a long time ago. They planned 40, 50, 60, 100 years always in advance, these people. They knew what the radionucleoids could do. They knew what the atomic age was going to do. Oppenheimer had literally no doubt what this was going to do. And we are only beginning to understand it. Last night was a really prime example of what just low-level radiation ultimately can do and will do. And low-level radiation that is coming out of Fukushima is much worse than what was in Fallujah. And I got an article there that I'll bring up very quick, and I'm going to come up over to the conversation center again. And I just want you to radioactive sea spray has been shown to blow hundreds of kilometers inland, hundreds of kilometers inland, just to spray, not the rain that's picking it up and dragging it in. Not the thousands of miles of cloud, but just the sea spray itself, w the way it liberates itself when it hits the coastline. Because normally, when water hits the coastline, right, there's that evaporation, that liberation of uh, oxygen molecules and other molecules, obviously, as it hits the coastline. And it's been said many times that the, the motion of the ocean smashing into the coastline that's why uh, the first 30 feet of the shoreline is so rich because it has all this oxygen being liberated. And that's why uh, so much marine life gravitate to those zones. Uh, on the east coast of Canada, the ice will come in and scrub the entire coastline. So every spring when you go down there, there's hundreds of trillions everywhere you look. Literally, in your sight, hundreds of trillions. It seems like that anyway. But it's been recorded at much higher numbers than that. Of, of little life, 
little sea urchin, sea cucumbers, sea anemones, starfish. And we see the San Francisco uh, Chronicle today. Headroy up on E&E &E News. The decimation of the starfish all the way from Mexico all the way up to uh, shitty Alaska. That's just my personal joke. I've been up I've been up to Alaska. We we actually chartered a plane uh, after being on the ocean for 106 days. Uh, we had four days off where we head back out for another 100 day trip. And we had chartered a plane up to Ketchikan, Alaska for 24 hours. And with the intention of getting drunk, and I think we spent around $4,500 on the hotel room and the booze in 24 <laughs> hours. And we flew back into Canada the next afternoon and the bar gave us a tube four a beer for the plane <laughs> and baseball caps each. So when we got off the plane, float plane in uh, Ketchikan or uh, Br British Columbia, Canada, and uh, Prince Rupert, just a quick story. Uh, the, the <laughs> Cause you gotta imagine now you're in this plane, you're bouncing around, you're drinking a two four. You already drank for 24 hours into oblivion. Uh, and he asked us, do we have anything to declare? And I was like, my legs crossed, going, if you let me pee over there, there won't be nothing to declare. But, uh, you know, because it was, it's just, ah, he finally got sick of him, let me go do it. We're a bunch of drunk divers, you got to realize, after 106 days on the ocean, it didn't take very many beer to make it really stupid, certainly. Uh, so I know I switched and banged around the Uh, so radioactive sea, radioactive sea spray has been shown to blow hundreds of kilometers inland, but the clouds will take it thousands of miles inland. The typhoons, the tornadoes, the F4 and F5 tornadoes, like the one that hit the Philippines, will make the coastlines uninhabitable anyway. And that could happen tomorrow. That could happen the day after. right? Because there's so much radiation in that ocean at this stage. But I want to come back over to the comment section. I didn't want to... I didn't want to go into one of my digressions. A transformer at the nuclear one plant in Roosevelt caught fire this morning. The London Volunteer Fire Department got the blaze under control by mid-afternoon. Energy officials say there's no public threat. No injuries were reported. One of the reactors is offline, but a second reactor is operational. The plant supplies over 1,800 megawatts of power, equivalent to about 30% of the state's total energy demand. Japan's Environment and Reconstruction Ministers will visit towns near the damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. They're hoping the communities will agree to host intermediate storage sites for hazardous waste. The government is planning to build the facilities, the towns of Futaba, Okuma, Okuma and Naraha. The buildings will be designed to hold radioactive soil and debris collected during decontamination work. Government officials conducted feasibility studies of the land and an expert panel concluded that the towns are geologically capable of hosting the sites. Community leaders have agreed to the studies but have yet to give their consent to move forward with the plan. Some residents oppose it. We'll give residents a clear description of the proposed location and size of the facility. Senior Vice Environment Minister Shinji Inoue said he hopes to secure permission from the towns as soon as possible. Government officials plan to start storing radioactive waste in the facilities in January 2015. The ministers will also meet the mayor of Tomioka, another town near the plant. The community already hosts a disposal facility. They plan to ask the town to accept waste with 100,000 backrolls or less of radioactive substances per kilogram. When Japan was hit by a giant tsunami in 2011, the hundreds of thousands forced to flee literally saw their lives washed away. Promises were made that it would only be a matter of time before their homes were rebuilt, but as RT's Alexei Hrashevsky found out, those people are still waiting. This woman can only fit me and my cameraman into her new home. She apologizes, but there's simply no room for the whole crew inside. She's one of resettlers from the Fukushima area, forced to leave their homes amid the 2011 nuclear disaster. When the tsunami hit, we were told to pack only necessary things and run away. They said it would be only for two, three days. Now, living in this cage of a house, 
Returning to our old house is a dream which we know won't ever come true. We are being fed with promises of a bigger house, but that's as far as it gets, promises. This is just one of the quickly erected residential areas where Fukushima exiles have relocated to. There are hundreds of makeshift camps scattered across the region, accommodating more than 300,000 people. All of the 400 resettlers living in this particular area used to have large houses before the Fukushima accident. Now they are forced to live in this 30 square meter dwellings. They were told that this would be just a short term measure, but it seems in their case, the old saying, there is nothing more permanent than temporary, suits very well. The majority of these people are pensioners suffering from different ailments. They are jobless, just as surprisingly many of their younger neighbors. This man used to run a profitable venture. Now he barely makes ends meet. I had a $100,000 a year business producing honey. Now it's destroyed forever, just like my life. On top of all that, I'm offered neither financial compensation nor any job. That's why I'm taking TEPCO to court. The government says it's working on improving conditions for resettlers, but with the Fukushima clear-up draining billions of dollars out of the state budget, it could take years, maybe even a decade, to do that. Even local officials are being kept in the dark. The government says it's building bigger houses, but will finish it in no sooner than two years. And not all of these people will be able to live in those. That's as little as we, officials on the ground, are told by the central government. Fukushima means a happy island in Japanese, but that's the last word these people would ascribe to their lives, which are unlikely to ever return to normal, especially with the government admitting the area around the nuclear site might never again be suitable to live in. Alexei Roshevsky, RT, reporting from Japan. It's been almost three years since the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident, but people in the area still fear the risk of cancer and other illnesses caused by consuming contaminated food and drink. More than 320,000 people in the prefecture have already been tested for internal contamination with a device called the whole body counter. But the device was designed to test adults. It can't be used for infants because they're too small. In response to this problem, scientists developed a new testing device for babies. NHK World's Mitsuko Nishikawa reports. Tests for radiation exposure for infants began at a hospital in Hirata village. Over 30 families showed up for the tests. I have been so worried. I've been waiting a long time for my baby to be checked. I don't know what will happen when my baby grows up, so I'd like this checkup. Yumi Takahara lives 80 kilometers from the nuclear plant. She has long been worried about the effects of the radiation on her three daughters. Manami, the youngest, is six months old. I'd feel safer if my baby were checked at a younger age. This new device is called Baby Scan. It measures the internal radiation level of an infant placed inside it. Infants undergoing the radiation check are placed in this compartment where they remain for four minutes. The machine has a relatively wide opening and children can watch their parents during the checkup, which helps them stay relaxed. Professor Ryugo Hayano of University of Tokyo headed the research team that developed the scanner. He says the main challenge was to make it as precise as possible. Even though the baby or the children are having eating the same amount of radioactive cesium as, uh, as compared to, to parents, the, the amount of radioactive cesium accumulated in the body will be much less. In order to, uh, to quantify the, uh, the amount of radioactive cesium in the body, it doesn't make sense to measure uh, with the same detection limit as, as used for, ch for adults. The machine makes meticulous calculations and is designed to block as much external radiation as possible. It has four radiation sensors, twice as many as previous models. 
Takahara was anxious to hear the results of the scan. Manami was put into the machine. She cried a bit because she had to be away from her mother for several minutes. But her body was successfully measured and the examination was completed. The results came in minutes later. No cesium is detected. We have been eating a variety of foods, so that was my main concern. I am very relieved to hear this positive result. A thousand people have already made appointments to have their children examined. Thanks to this machine, those most vulnerable to radiation, infants, are finally beginning to get the protection they need. Mitsuko Nishikawa, NHK World, Fukushima. U.S. Ambassador to Japan has visited a city her country hit with an atomic bomb in 1945. Caroline Kennedy used her trip to Nagasaki to call for more efforts to rid the world of nuclear weapons. Nagasaki Mayor Tomihisa Taue welcomed Kennedy at the city's atomic bomb museum. The ambassador went for a tour. Then she met three atomic bomb survivors. She said the visit deeply moved her, and she referred to her father, the late President John F. Kennedy. President Kennedy uh, was very proud that he was able to start the process of nuclear disarmament. Kennedy then went to Peace Park. She placed a wreath before a statue dedicated to prayers for peace. She and Mayor Taue planted flowering dogwood saplings. The Americans gave this type of tree to Japan nearly a century ago in return for the 3,000 cherry tree saplings the Japanese gave them in 1912. A representative of the Japan Confederation of A and H Bomb Sufferers Organizations followed Kennedy's visit. He wants her to send a message back to Washington. Because of the bombing, people were unable to live or die as human beings. I want the ambassador to tell President Obama to come and visit Nagasaki. Taniguchi also emphasized that atomic bomb survivors are striving for a world without nuclear weapons.